Yes, Ms Scott. Uh, Dr Bolton, I've got a, um, a number of questions from core participants, so um, I think we'll, we'll be going slightly all over the place. But um, uh, the first question is in relation to the evidence you gave this morning about your time in Liverpool, and you were describing how uh, for children um, it was your practice was to give them cryoprecipitate, and then at some point as they got older concentrate. And the question is, at what age would you typically make the decision to move from cryoprecipitate to concentrate on, on the basis of age? I am not sure that there was a very consistent policy there, but I suspect that it would be when they became teenagers. So somewhere between the age of uh, 13 and 17, um, depending upon all sorts of things like their, the frequency of their bleeds, uh, actually how big they were. As much as anything else, it was their size. So that, um, uh, 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 um, uh, and indeed, uh, some of the boys by the age of 13, having uh, been well treated, would be quite well. So consequently, you had to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think it would be round about then. But I have to say, I have no clear memory of operating that policy specifically. I, I'm, my answer is based to some extent on suppositions and probabilities rather than actually remembering a, a precise set of circumstances. And in your evidence this, um, in your evidence this morning, you said uh, that the amount of confidential material which was inappropriately confidential and hampered communications was quite profound. Now, you've given us some evidence this afternoon about what you found and what you concluded from looking at, at, at records in uh, Wessex. Was that also the case in, in Liverpool and Edinburgh? Um, is that uh, about donor? Donor characteristics. Well, I, I I think you in in a in a I, I can't remember the the question that I asked you, but it, it, as part of your response, you said word either these words or words to this effect: the amount of confidential material which was inappropriately confidential and hampered yeah. communication was quite profound. Um, I, I say you you've dealt with that in relation to Wessex, but is there something you can assist us with whether you found that also to be the case in Liverpool and Edinburgh? Well, in um, uh, uh, Liverpool and Edinburgh uh, were, were a very different set of circumstances. I don't... Uh, uh, um, Liverpool, 40 years ago, confidentiality, the concept among medical practitioners, um, um, including myself, was perhaps less sophisticated than it is now. Um, and to, uh, uh, to a certain extent, my shame... I will be party to the common medical practice of um, making personal rec records of um, patient details in ways that would be inappropriate these days. So, in a sense, um, that was relying on a, a concept of confidentiality that no one would ever see what we'd written. Uh, nowadays, a completely misplaced concept, but that was fairly common at that time. And as uh, we grew more experienced and became more aware of the really important nature of patient uh, um, professional relationships, I think we changed. In Edinburgh, I think there, uh, it wasn't for me so much a, a record of patients um, uh, because uh, uh, um, it, it was more a question of confidentiality of communications around staff. And that was a real problem because, uh, I mean, I know that some of my colleagues have been uh, re required to sign the Official Secrets Act um, uh, uh, concerning their discussions in committees, um, and yet <laughs> they've all been revealed. So it's actually, that was a real hamper to communications. So that part of my answer was probably more directed towards the degree of professional confidentiality and the way that interfered with um, uh, with uh, the, the transmission of 
the communications um, about policies, etc. Uh, there's a lot of secrecy about at that time, which I think was unnecessary, uh, possibly because those who were talking felt uh, uh, vulnerable. Um, uh, but these days, I rather hope that attitudes have changed and the concept of openness and accountability is at least acknowledged more, although sadly, um, judging by uh, official public records on, on other circumstances, the de degree of redactions when people ask for uh, the, the freedom of information inquiries is still, there's a lot of, um, uh, um, a lot of ob obfuscation at that, that level. So my feeling is that confidentiality often went too far and hampered communications, both with patients who should have been uh, uh, handled better, with donors who could have had clearer information about what was required of them, and then within the professional professions that were involved in the whole uh, provision of blood service. So that, that's my answer to that, my rather long answer to that particular question. <clears throat> You referred to cryoprecipitate being made uh, in your time as a houseman from plasma collected from the naval base in Portsmouth in the late 1960s. Uh, can you recall what knowledge there was or what consideration was given at that time to the risk of viral hepatitis being transmitted by military personnel at the naval base? And of course, bearing in mind that this was pre-hepatitis B screening. But still, no one... Uh, to be associated with transmitting hepatitis. The answer to that question is there would have been no regards taken to that particular aspect. Um, in fact, um, Dr. O'Brien, who was the consultant in charge, a very eminent hematologist, part of the team that discovered Christmas disease in Oxford in uh, 1952, um, uh, was, uh, was a very effective operator and he would have had no hesitation under the circumstances of this particular patient in pulling strings with his contacts in the navy getting onto the boats and having a lot of uh, exercise in producing literally hundreds of donations the effect on the staff of the lab i learned afterwards was profound uh, and particularly as in the end it all turned out to be um the, the, the patient died uh, fairly soon. So a lot of hard work um, for a, a, a particular episode. Um, but in terms of things like transmuting, transmitted infections, no, uh, that was the last thing on Dr. O'Brien's mind. And I have to say that it wasn't very prominent in my mind either, because this was a very significantly ill person who I thought was unlikely to survive anyway. Um did you, when you were in Liverpool, did you monitor the white cells of your patients, i.e. the CD4 and CD8 counts and ratios? No. Were you involved in white cell testing on haemophilia patients, i.e. e.g. CD4, CD8 counts and ratios, while you were in Edinburgh? No. Um, in relation to the infection um, with AIDS in Edinburgh, what investigations were done into how the products uh, those patients received had come to be infected by a donor in Scotland? Um, there would have been extensive, there were extensive records of the donors who uh, attended particular sessions. Those donors could be identified with each batch of factor H concentrate that was produced by PSC. So it was indeed possible, at least in theory, to trace everybody who don't, to identify, or at least have some identifying features of everybody who gave. Uh, it was not possible to be 100% certain that on following up those donors, uh, the, the, those identifications, what would reach the intended donor. They may have moved away, they may indeed have died. Um, or, or something else might have happened and we wouldn't have known about that. So the, the system was very sophisticated, very intensive, but by no means expected to be 100% foolproof. And I think that the, the donor or donors who are implicated in that, who, who would have contaminated that batch, were never actually identified. 
You described NHS factor concentrates as being derived only from the blood of British people. And I've been asked to um, uh, uh, ask you whether or not that that's in fact correct. Is it the case that tourists uh, at the Edinburgh Festival, for example, may have been able to donate blood? You're absolutely right. Um, I should have said people donating in Britain. So we would, we would not have excluded uh, tourists. Um, that was one of the concerns we had about the Edinburgh Festival, um, the possibility that American visitors in their spirit of goodwill would turn up at a donor session, offer to give blood, and they would not have been turned down. Um, unless, unless, unless we actually identify the specific feature. Sorry, Dr. Bolton, I'm just getting in uh, another question. <laughs> Um, so uh, let me just um, thank you. Um, do you know anything, uh, 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 do you have any awareness of, of blood being collected at the US naval base in, in um, Holy Lock in the 1980s? Um, there were uh, um, donations from military and naval institutions collected in Edinburgh at that particular time. Um, I wasn't actually responsible for those organisations, but I think on looking back, there were some uh, sessions at those. Those would have been included in a sort of public session, uh, and uh, so consequently, uh, um, they, uh, I could not exclude the possibility of that happening, but I wasn't directly involved. And so presumably, those sessions would have been taking donations from US naval... Yeah, what I don't know is how, how long that continued, into the 1980s. Um, just in relation to the position at Wessex, uh, at the time that hepatitis C testing was instituted, did you recall blood or blood products that, were, that had already been issued prior to 1st of September? So they would have been untested, sent out to the hospitals prior to the 1st of September. Would you, did you recall those to get them tested or, or destroy them? I'm not sure that I quite understand the question, but is it that, uh, OK, the, the tests were introduced on the 14th of October for HIV. Um, uh, blood collected before the, uh, that date, but which was still in date, was that tested for HIV before it was distributed. And I'm pretty sure the answer to that is they were tested so that after the 14th of October, no blood in the blood bank of Edinburgh uh, Royal Infirmary uh, had, been, had not been tested for HIV. I am fairly sure that's the situation. So this is a question in relation to Wessex and... and oh, sorry, Wessex. Testing. So, uh, so um, the question is, for the, for the blood and blood products that had been uh, issued from Wessex prior to 1st of September 1991, i.e. So, untested. The HCV, yes. HCV. Yes, okay. Would those have been recalled or could untested blood have been issued and used from hospitals post 1st September 1991? I cannot actually remember if there was a recall at that particular time. And that's why I think I couldn't exclude the possibility of untested blood being issued at that time. But um, I think that's what I said at the time. So I'm not sure. It's a possibility distinctly that some blood may have been issued that was not, uh, um, that had not been tested for HCV. But I, 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 um, I can't be certain of that. And we've heard some... Uh, centres recalled all the blood and blood products that were sitting in their hospitals uh, and so um, th that was untested, recalled it and either tested it or destroyed it. Did Wessex do that? I cannot recall if that's what happened at Wessex. Uh, and in relation to um, products in Wessex that had been made and were untested prior to 1st of September 91, frozen components that have a long shelf life, it, 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 were they tested um, before they were released? That's a very good question about the, the testing, um, both for uh, the HIV and, and the HCV. Um, 
uh, because the frozen stuff would have been still there a year or so after they donated. So there could be stuff that was collected in September 19, uh, uh, 1990 that was still in, in our in, in our freezers. Um, and to be honest, I cannot recall how those donations were handled. Um, so I, I, I can't give a satisfactory answer to that question. Um, I think it could, it may be possible to check um, what, uh, from colleagues who have retired, who I know are still around, uh, what their recollection of that particular experience was. And the other person who might have an insight is Dr. Andrew Herborn, if he's contactable, and uh, we could do our best to try to contact him. This is returning now to your time in Liverpool. Uh, you said that you thought patients preferred NHS concentrates because they knew of the risk. They they knew that that, that the risks were that, that it was a less risky product than the commercial concentrate. What's the factual basis for your belief that patients preferred NHS concentrate for that for that reason? Did your patients tell you that, or was that an assumption on your part? I think some patients would have. Uh would have um, mentioned it possibly in passing. Don't forget that the World in Action program uh, of 1970, uh, uh, whenever that was, was a uh, was Granada. And lots of people in Liverpool would have uh, heard it. So consequently, there was an awareness, certainly among the haemophilic community in Liverpool, uh, of that particular program. And it did ask, cause them to ask all sorts of questions about the nature of the product. So uh, from that point of view, the, the program achieved its aims. Uh, it may not have achieved the aims of actually banning the import of American products, but nevertheless. So that program was actually very informative to quite a lot of the um, people I was dealing with in Liverpool. Did you tell your patients directly uh, about the relative risks of cryoprecipitate versus concentrate? Um, I do not recall specific conversations to that effect. Um, I think it's highly likely that I would have done uh, to explain to those on home programs who, why cryoprecipitate was was preferred, but I, 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 I honestly cannot say uh, the um, how much of detail I went into with the patients of that level. Um, I, I apologize for my lack of memory on that one. It's an important question, but uh, I, I can't answer it in any more detail than I think I probably did. Um, uh, and it may be that this is the, the answer to this question is the same, but but, but I've been asked to ask it. So, uh, again, did you discuss the relative merits of pool sizes and the impact on on infection risk with your patients? Um, again, that featured in the World in Action program, and so if that question was asked, I would have answered uh, about the 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 greater risk potentially from the, the larger pool of products. But again, I don't recall specific conversations to that effect. Now, you told us that you would tell patients if you thought that they had contracted non-A, non-B. Would you also tell them that the illness was due to the products that had been provided to them for their medical treatment? Yes, I think I would have done. Um, and that also, also goes for hepatitis B. As I think I said, so our patients who contracted hepatitis B, I think they or their parents would have been informed this would have come from the product which they were given. And the last question I'm going to ask you is, did you also, for those patients that you thought had contracted non-A, non-B, did you also explain the potential long-term consequences of liver cancer, cirrhosis and so on? I don't think I would have done. I was not particularly aware of, of those risks. I, I was of hepatitis, of the cancer, but not of, uh, of um, 
the cancer from hepatitis B contamination, but I wasn't, I don't think anybody was really aware of the long term consequences uh, of hepatitis C uh, until Eric Preston published his paper in 1978. Um, and I can't recall any specific questions from the haemophilia community uh, with regard to that. So I don't think I would have told them about the long-term risk of um, th them getting uh, a, a product contaminated with non-A and non-B. So those are the questions that I'm going to ask um, from the core participants. Thank you. Um, just, just one question, which comes out of the, the question you had early on in this session about confidentiality and what you said uh, earlier about um, the, a description of, of a mother as histrionic. Um, you would uh, accept, would you, that a, a character assessment is not part of the proper function of a doctor whose job is to treat a, a patient medically? I would agree. Well, that must then yes, mean that, that, that must then mean that comments about how nice a person is or how lively, etc., are unlikely to be of any clinical significance and should be omitted. Would you be happy with that? That is correct. That that is correct from the yeah, yeah that I would say. But on the other hand, um, there is such a thing as developing human relationships, and. Uh, so one isn't necessarily effective in doing that if one adopts to uh, uh, objective a, 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 um, a, 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 an approach. But certainly in documentation, uh, uh, um, any judgmentalism of that nature is inappropriate. And um, I, I actually think that that particular comment was unjustified uh, and um, inappropriate. So um, we, we, we learn as we go along. Well, you, you, you've made that, that perfectly clear, and I, I applaud you for it. Um, the, the thrust of the question really is the number of letters which the many will have seen from doctors which uh, say nice things about a patient, yeah. but they're not to the patient, so they're not forming a relationship with the patient by doing so. Uh, they are really beside the point when it comes to medical treatment. Is there really any place for them? Well, I think there, there is, um, if it's not meant in a that sort of critical, judgmental way. Um, I mean, doctors particularly, or well, any, anyone who has face-to-face -face contact uh, with people uh, on that sort of medico-social basis um, and who is describing uh, in a professional context their experience with that, um, I think is entitled to uh, um, put a, a, a human face onto the nature of their communications and that to be... Uh, um, totally objective could actually appear to be heartless and in itself therefore have regrettable consequences. So philosophically I think we are dealing with people who have feelings um, whether they're our co-professionals and in particular whether they're the people we have some responsibility for their care. Um, so consequently putting that human face on our communications um, is, I think, an understandable, and on the whole, so long as it's not overdone, and so long as it's also honest, um, it, it is a justifiable, it is a justifiable approach. Well, th th thank you, thank you for that. That's all that I ask, Miss Scott. So, um, so Dr. Bolton's uh, legal representatives don't have any questions, so it just falls to ask Dr. Bolton whether or not he would like to add anything to his evidence. Yes, thank you. I, I would. Um, uh, and I've got it written down, so I will be reading it out. Um, I am profoundly sorry and deeply regret that my professional activities as a doctor during the period covered by the inquiry 
led to the deaths and sufferings of so many people. In the late 1970s, I was responsible for the care of haemophiliacs, haemophiliacs in Merseyside and prescribed vials of commercially prepared factor VIII concentrate, many of which happened to be contaminated with viruses and led to the development of hepatitis or AIDS, and sometimes both. Within 10 years or so, many of these people have died, had died, while others had to cope with the severe morbidity of chronic infection. AIDS was unknown at that time, but almost certainly some batches of the commercial products given in the late 1970s were contaminated with AIDS viruses originating from plasma bought by American fractionators. On the other hand, potential contamination with viruses causing hepatitis was well recognized by professionals, including myself, and not just in commercial products, but also from donations to the UK blood transfusion services. Although from the early 1970s, screening tests were applied to, to UK blood donations to, to prevent the transfusions of blood contaminated with what's thought to be the most common source of serum hepatitis, that's hepatitis B, it is recognized that these tests were unlikely to offer complete protection even from hepatitis B. And furthermore, that other hepatitis-related viruses, especially non-A, non-B, could not be detected even when present in NHS blood. Nevertheless, the professional consensus was that such infections were usually mild, often asymptomatic, and short-lived, so that the possibility of adverse consequences were often downplayed when advising the patients and their parents. I should have done my best to ensure that everyone who received blood and blood products understood that there were risks of transfusion transmitted infections in the products they were using. Um, although the degree of those risks was unknown. I was keen to extend the home therapy program for the haemophiliacs in Merseyside, and this was welcomed by the haemophilia community, especially the mothers of, of affected boys. Mothers, uh, many mothers, on learning that they had carried the defective gene to their sons, felt guilty, although such carriage was actually a form of lottery. Nevertheless, many were keen to be trained by me so that they could deal with the consequences of their parentage and see the palpable relief of pain which would follow their administrations of factor VIII or factor IX to their young children. In no way can they be held responsible for the later sufferings of their children. After I left Liverpool in January 1980, I never saw those people again, although I note from some of the testimonies that the service to haemophilics in Merseyside may not have improved very much, if at all, until substantial developments occurred there under later haemophilia directors. The haemophilia, the haemophilia community on Merseyside uh, were great people and I missed them. But it was proper to let my immediate successors take over for me completely. I have felt since that I sort of deserted them in never having, for example, to conduct the personal and difficult conversations. Although uh, I also recognize the part that I played in this tragic saga when I was at Edinburgh and paid tribute to my Scottish colleagues who tried so hard to improve the testings for transmissible infections, to increase donor awareness and hence to improve patient safety, as well as the pioneering efforts to inactivate the viruses contaminating the plasma while retaining the biological clotting activity. The consequences of the contamination of Scottish factor VIII concentrates revealed in November 1984 were permanent and will never leave the affected patients, their families, myself, my Edinburgh BTS colleagues, and the Scottish haemophilia directors, and other people who administered the treatments. I am therefore very pleased with that this inquiry is taking place and hope that those people and their families who suffered and survived and the families of those who died obtain full recognition of their sufferings. 
I extend this, of course, to any recipient of UK blood who suffered from the contamination of that blood. I want no excuses, but hope that everyone gets a clear explanation enabling them to develop an adequate sense of closure. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, what you've given us uh, today has been really most informative. It really has. Uh, and you haven't sought to make excuses, um, quite the opposite in many cases. Um, perhaps living up to your name, you've been frank. Uh, it's... Um, <laughs> I hope you forgive me for that, but um, it is particularly useful, I think, for us to see somebody who's had experience from, as it were, both sides uh, of the um, of the fence, both in the transfusion service, but also as a treating clinician, and uh, has had the experience of doing it both in Liverpool and in Edinburgh and in dealing with blood supplies, both in Edinburgh uh, and in Wessex. So you have the ability to give a comparison to us, which few others have, uh, and I just want to thank you for that. Now, I'll turn to Miss Scott and, and ask her what we have in store for us next week. Well, sir, we um, sit again on Tuesday, the 8th of February, we start at 10 with a, West, with a presentation about Wessex before Dr. Bolton arrived in 1990, so the early years of Wessex, um, which will take us up till 12. Uh, and then we have the evid oral evidence remotely of Dr. Hugh Lloyd. Uh, he is abroad, and so he, the plan is for his evidence to begin at 1. Yes, uh, he, he's, he's in Canada, I think. So uh, we will have, we start him at, at one. Yes. Very well. 10 o'clock then are on Monday. Um, thank you again. On Tuesday, sir. Uh, on Tuesday. <laughs> Dear me, it's getting too late in the day, isn't it? But um, uh, thank you for your staying power too, um, Dr. Bolton. Uh, so uh, until Tuesday, 10 o'clock, good night. <laughs>